Ready? We're going to go ahead and get started. So good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Laura Velke. I'm the president of the Arts District Community Council, LA, or ABCCLA. And with me is Javier Meyer Borani, president of the Los Angeles River Artists and Business Association, or LARABA. On behalf of both organizations, we are thrilled to welcome you to our first council, District 14 Town Hall. <coughs> Excuse me. ADCCLA and LARABA have a long history of civic and community engagement. In these unprecedented times, we felt the need for a different approach. Rather than a traditional debate format, we envisioned a town hall setting where we, as neighbors, could have meaningful conversations with the candidates and each other about the issues that directly impact our lives. The election cycle brought forth two candidates for Council District 14, incumbent Kevin DeLeon and civil rights attorney Isabel Corrado. In early July, we reached out to both candidates to propose individual town halls. Our goal was to offer an intimate platform for discussing the critical issues affecting the arts district community and CD14 as a whole. We are grateful to Art Share LA for generously offering their theater to host the candidates on the 14th and the 21st of September. The first candidate to respond was given the opportunity to select their date. Ms. Ferrado's team responded promptly and chose the 21st for tonight's event. Unfortunately, despite our repeated efforts, Mr. DeLeon's team showed no meaningful interest in participating. We extended deadlines to accommodate his participation, but ultimately we had to release the venue due to a lack of response. While we are disappointed that we cannot present both candidates' vision for our community, we are excited to have Ms. Ferrado join us uh, tonight. This is a unique opportunity to hear directly from a candidate seeking your vote in November. Before we begin, we'd like to establish some ground rules for tonight's event. The questions posed to the candidate have been informed by the leadership experience of the Arts District and by the thoughtful questions submitted by CD14 stakeholders. Additionally, the boards um, have decided to focus this town hall exclusively on the issues of Council District 14. We have specifically requested that the candidate not address questions related to the conflict in Palestine. While we understand this may disappoint some stakeholders, we believe it is important to prioritize the pressing issues of our community for this event. If time allows, we will take additional questions on the topic discussed tonight. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Javier Meyer Barami, President of La Raba, to say a few words, and then we'll welcome Ms. Serrato to the stage. Javier? Thank you, Laura, and thank you, everybody, for coming and taking up some time on your Saturday evening. Um, I think we should just jump right in, so please um, help me in welcoming Isabel Curado to the stage. Hi, Isabel. Welcome. Hello, hello. Thank Hi, you. everyone. Thank you for putting this together, and thanks for having such a beautiful space. This is great. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Welcome to Art Chair LA, uh, a beautiful space here in the Arts District. Um, they uh, do affordable housing and studio space for artists and have been doing it for a very long time, so welcome. Um, I think we should um, just jump right into the first question. So, uh, what inspired you to run for public office? Uh, how have these experiences uniquely prepared you to lead this district? Right. Um, truth be told, I never thought I would run for office. Um, I've been very contented as a worker bee, and all of the pomp and circumstance I actually found quite ridiculous. Um, but, you know, I've been a daughter of this district. I'm born and raised Highland Park, still living in the house that I grew up in. I'm a daughter of undocumented Filipino immigrants. My dad migrated here without his paperwork, and, you know, like many immigrants do, they toil on, right? He was without his paperwork, was a victim of racial discrimination, wage theft, and at one point ICE even tried to get him, but you know, he kept moving forward, la lucha sigue, and he was able to get his citizenship, and he and my mom bought a home in Highland Park in the 80s, and were able to give us a really nice life. Cut to 2008, I um, you know, had just come back from my first year of private college, and I found out I was pregnant, faced with a really tough choice, had to drop out of college, went on food stamps, went to community college, and with the help of my community, was able to transfer to UCLA. 
And these are the personal experiences that I bring to this position, which has taught me so many things, right? Resilience, hard work, uh, resourcefulness, and it is the story that, frankly, a lot of people in this district can resonate with as well. But it's not just my personal experiences, right? It's my professional experiences. I have been um, an attorney. I defended workers against wage theft like my father faced uh, because I wanted to stop other families from going through what I went through. And I was an eviction defense attorney watching renters and small businesses get priced out um, in Highland Park really motivated me in to be, do that work, right? Recognizing that rents going up don't just affect renters, but they also affect small businesses. And that was a lacking uh, focal point of gentrification that I felt was, was missing and wanted to provide legal support for that. Now that job coincided with the pandemic, which just became eviction defense work, really, you know, plugging a hole in the sinking ship as it were. Um, and so I wanted to do something more meaningful and helping tenants and businesses in long term. And so I became a community lawyer, uh, helping small businesses and community orgs you know, start a business, uh, buy back real estate in their neighborhood to keep it affordable, uh, either for renters, small businesses, or keep open space. Because I think right now in this economy, that is one of the rare, inter one of the few interventions available for folks and wanting to do that. And so, you know, running for office, uh, when the tapes came out, I was angry. And from anger and frustration, I'm driven into service. And I thought, if my community gave me all of these privileges, you know, getting to graduate, getting to become an attorney, then this was my way of giving back. And if we were going to make it, it would be great, but I really wasn't expecting it. And now here we are in front of you today, um, having this conversation, uh, having come out on top. And I think it's an immense responsibility and duty that I feel towards this community. And so wanting to really usher us into a new era of leadership and where people are in this position because they want to be and they want to stay and really start helping the community heal from this absent leadership or crooked leadership that we've had. So diving in a little bit more into your candidacy, uh, you know, they're neither good as, neither of these is good or bad, but some candidates will run on a larger vision uh, for a district or a city, and other candidates will run on the, you know, fix it um, and repair it, right? Mm -hmm. Fix and repair. Um, I'm curious, where do you sit on that question? Mm, I, I'm a little bit of both, right? Uh, fix and repair in that we've had decades of leadership in which our council members have had limited continuity because of various scandals whether they've resigned in disgrace or they promised us they weren't going to leave our district but ran for mayor and then left us, or now they're in prison for corruption and bribery, and we have awesome monuments to their corruption, which is the graffiti towers. Um, and then we also have our current council member who was absent from work for two months and 400 votes and yet still has a job. <laughs> um, and so, you know, that's what we want to fix and repair. Lack of representation, lack of um, continuity in services and being listened to. Like every neighborhood in this district, arts district included, right? When you knock on their door, they say, I haven't been heard. My community has been forgotten. They always blame downtown, but they don't know that even when you go to downtown and you talk to the residents, they also feel forgotten and there's community there. And um, so I think that's what we wanna fix. I mean, baseline folks are asking for honesty, city services and, and reliability, which seem like baseline things. Right. So I would like to fix it so that that's a expectation of service and not a demand, right? And then the vision I have for this district, right? Um, I want it to be a district where we can develop without displacing people, that people won't be worried about the next, like people are worried about if the next election of whomever it would be, but they're still gonna be living here, right? Or they're gonna be moving. Like even one of our canvassers was like, I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to live in LA after this election, right? Just because things are getting so hard. And so fighting for better workers' rights and housing rights and housing affordability and really attacking our homelessness crisis. So these are all big things, but I think one, <laughs> one nerdy part of my vision, which is not the sexy, like 
progressive political is really just making this bureaucracy, which is city government, work better. You know, making hiring uh, for you know city positions easier, right? Making uh, the bureaucracy and streamlining various processes so we can have people to get permits. Like those are the unsexy things that I think about and dream about fixing because I think the city has really good policies. It's just if only we could make them all in alignment and work for people, right? Whether it's our transportation or even our climate goals, so, yeah. Thank you, and we'll get to um, development and homelessness a little bit later, um, but Laura. So I'm sure you have had this question, but what about your professional experience qualifies you to lead a district of 260,000 people without prior public office experience? And I know that's a loaded question. <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, we have to, I think first and foremost, I hear that. I also think we gotta give people with lived experiences the credit that maybe they don't have on a resume, but all the things that people go through, right? Like an unhoused resident that is now working, think about the resilience that they have and resourcefulness that they've had to go through. Um, I manage a lot of my cousins and being in that managerial role, I think if anybody here is a mom, you understand being a CEO, a CFO, the COO, um, especially if you're single. <laughs> I'm still finding a COO. Um, but you know, I think there's something to be said about that, right? But my professional experiences when it comes to housing and homelessness, I was at the front lines of these failed policies when it comes to tenant rights and tenant protections, right? There are severe problems in that. Like when you think about a veteran who's trying to apply for a Section 8 voucher, did you know that his, um, like a veteran's benefits, the monetary benefits that they get for being a veteran is included in their income calculation, which then precludes them from actually getting a Section 8 voucher. It doesn't make sense, right? It's the systems are not working. And watching some of my clients go through that process and having to defend that this he got, he's getting disability for serving. And that disability payment shouldn't make him over income for the housing that he, des he deserves, right? Um, so that's one, uh, you know, that's what I can extrapolate from my professional experience. The other thing is with housing development and housing affordability. I think we need bolder approaches. We talk about social housing and what does it actually look like, right? And in my day job as an attorney, I help four women in Koreatown form a housing cooperative. And if you all know, across the country, housing cooperatives are so much more com common and they in various instances. So these were four women, women of color, former tenants who fought off their predatory landlord and with a grant from a government agency and a community land trust were able to buy back their building. And they have one unit, a parking spot in Koreatown. These are women that would never have a chance at, at equity and home ownership. And now they have, they have equity, they have a unit that's gonna be affordable in perpetuity as long as they stay there, and they have an asset to give to their heirs. And so working with community land trusts and housing cooperatives, I want to invest in these approaches as we voted for ULA, you need to spend the money and try this um, in different ways and try different things. And I don't think that's what other folks that are running in the position can offer. Um, and, and so thinking about that is how I think it could be different. The last thing I'll say, man, I yap a lot, um, is that, you know, I hidden from my bio is that I worked for the city 10 years ago. So I worked on a, the city council campaign that lost CD13 for John Choi against Mitchell Farrell. And um, you know, my first job after that was working uh, for as an assistant for a deputy mayor of city services. And the departments that he oversaw were animal services, arts and culture, um, the Bureau of Public Works, which includes street services, contract administration, the street lighting, sanitation. He also oversaw DWP, transportation, recreation and parks, the zoo. And so all of the outward facing constituent service departments that a council member would be in charge of to deliver your requests were what we oversaw. And so that gave me my local government 101 and a lot of my colleagues are still there 
Some of them are executive directors of departments that are newly formed since then, like the child, um, like the youth development department, right? And I think for me, although I have these values, I know people in these departments who can hold up <laughs> some things or can help hasten the process. And so um, knowing the alphabet soup of City Hall, I think is gonna set me apart and set me up for success if elected. So this, this next question um, kind of parlays into that. So community engagement is essential for effective governance, but there seems to be a disconnect between city government and the needs of the community. How will you ensure that our well-researched voices are prioritized in decision-making over outside influences? Are you open to establishing committees to holding or holding regular dialogues to maintain this focus? Or do you have other ideas on, on how we make government yeah, uh, I love this question because I think the answer is clear is that I show up, right? Um, that's why I'm here. Uh, there has been not, there was absent one forum that I missed because my daughter was sick. I've gone to all of them in the primary. My opponent didn't come to them, right? Um, I came when it was hostile. I came when I didn't know anybody. And I came because I wanted to introduce myself and get to know folks. And so for me, I am understanding that governance is about everybody and in fact, stakeholders like all of you, well-researched and all, like that is the strength of this, this, especially the arts district community, right? Is that you, it's like a, such, I was just talking about this the other day, it was like such an interesting case study of a neighborhood and what you're able to do. There's nary a corporate Starbucks in this neighborhood, right? I, well, well, there's one, but it took, how long did it take for it to get up? It sneaked in. It sneaked in. But, that, but that's like the beauty of what maybe a neighborhood like Boyle Heights wants for itself, right? Or even, well, I don't know, Igor kind of likes stuff like that. But I can say that because I'm from there. Um, but I think it's just as like an interesting case study of like how you are building community here um, with healthy dialogue and producing this and so, so, uh, so much to learn from. And you as the experts, um, are the ones that I would have to consult. So I'm very committed to co-governing. And being a council member, you're not necessarily the idea person. For me, it's like I'm an executor, right? Um, I'm working and govern, com, governing with all of you because you are the experts and at the end of the day, the decisions that I would make are ones that maybe I don't have to live with all the time, right? And so, I need to uplift the lived experiences and the people that are doing all of the work of telling me, you allowed a development here and they planted the trees, but then, or they never planted the trees, right? Or they ripped them out. And I'm not walking the arts district every single day. You all are. And so learning from all of you. And so we're committed to doing that on the campaign. We've been committed to, to doing that and we wanna do that when we're in office. You know, having a field deputy focused on downtown, of course, having monthly town halls. Um, you know, I've talked about it with other candidates, having a monthly town hall with like the congressional, the assembly member district, the county supervisor, and the city level, so that we can all get on the same page in these neighborhoods, because that's part of the problem, right? The lack of coordination. Um, it, I mean, I keep going to this football metaphor, but it's like, <laughs> city hall is like, 15 or 18 quarterbacks if you can include all of the city wide electives. And then you have to work with these other, with these other quarterbacks uh, that, that for different teams. And so there's no coordinated response, right? So wanting to do that and having, being available is definitely key to what I want to do. Okay, so speaking of development, yeah. uh, the downtown area, the Arts District, has recently um, been, uh, there's a new zoning plan that's been passed by the city of LA, okay. um, which allows for a lot more housing in all of downtown and specifically here in the Arts District, which used to be manufacturing. Mm -hmm. um, you've been seen both as anti-development and an advocate for affordable housing. Uh, so how do you reconcile these positions at the council district level. Do you support building housing in city or government-owned property? Um, 
do you believe that the housing model needs to change to something else? If so, what? Yeah, I mean, we've already, I think it's a, mis, it's a mischaracterization to say I'm anti-development. I'm for development, right? Uh, I'm for development without displacement. I think if a project is for affordable housing and in the process we're making people homeless without any uh, housing solution for them, then I ask the question of who is this affordable housing for, right? Um, and I think having that question is important in how we think about doing this, right? But I think, you know, I want development, right? When I, as I've gone through this process of coming from the primary to the general, I've done a lot of learning about downtown, right? And the commercial foreclosure crisis in downtown and that lost revenue, it feeds into the problem of our broken city budget where we have a six, was it 600 million shortfall in the next four years, which scares me as we are gonna host the US Open, the World Cup and the Olympics and All-Star Weekend, I found out, and not have enough money to meet our budget every year. So for me, revitalizing downtown, making sure that there's development, attracting commercial enterprises, whether they're small businesses or otherwise, to downtown is key to helping our city fix our budget problem, right? We can tighten our suspenders at the city, but if we have nothing coming in, then what are we really doing, right? It's hard to, to invest in other things. And so for me, you know, looking at the downtown LA plan, uh, 2040 and the adaptive reuse um, ordinance in there and looking at, I mean, honestly, at the end of the day, it'd be looking at all of you to say, what are the spaces that you think are right for development, right? Um, because with the community input from the outset, it helps us inform what developers can come to the table so that we can break ground as soon as possible instead of it being mired in controversy or, um, you know, just like, well, you know, uh, legal battles that can take so many years, which for us in this economy is like costing us every year that goes by a unit for uh, homelessness or for affordable housing went from $400,000 a unit to $700,000 a unit. So every year that these projects languish and go by is a missed opportunity. And again, the city is broke, right? And so trying to figure out how we can develop the area um, and, and do it wisely. So I would like to maybe just stay here for a little bit and, um, you know, dive in a little bit deeper. I mean, you know, again, the government-owned properties, is that a possibility um, for, for housing development? Um, and, and two, you know, going into how the community um, can help shape its own um, neighborhood, the new community plan does allow quite a bit more to be built by a rent, mm -hmm. right? Which means mm -hmm. that previously a lot of developers would have to come to the community ask for support of their projects and therefore we would be able to shape them um, to be what the community needs but with the new community plan a lot of that is gone away mm -hmm. yeah when it comes to our public owned properties i think you know i'm not we already know what the city owns right it's time that we build it like county supervisor hilda solis put their care village up in six months on county owned property and it was like it was under budget, it was amazing. Six months for interim housing with support services. Why aren't we doing this in CD14? You know, we know a lot of actually the city underutilized or unused city or county properties are in, in the district. We could be doing more. And CD14 has the most discretionary funds out of any of the other council districts. So we have the power to do something bolder or something you know, like that. And so it's just like, why aren't we doing that? And so happy to start doing that as well, because those are, that's the cheapest way right now with land being expensive as it is. I think when it comes to the second question about by right versus the discretionary approvals, right? I mean, my whole approach to govern, governance is about centering community always in the process, right? When I view myself as council member, especially when it comes to developments, I see myself as the lead negotiator for CD14, right? And my, like I see myself as like a lawyer-client relationship. 
where the residents or you know the businesses, CD14 constituents are my client. And so in negotiating what happens in this district with a developer, I have to represent you, right? I may not always agree with it, but at the end of the day, you're living with the consequences of those choices, and so working together to steward that process, right? And so for me, even if it is by right, I still think there are ways in which a council member can intervene in that process um, in some ways, whether it's stalling it or inputting uh, or representing the community even with the conversations with the developer. Okay. Uh, so this next one is uh, really important to us as the arts district. I think Greater Downtown. Um, both communities need both communities need more parks than tree canopies. Uh, but housing developments often receive waivers to reduce green space, disproportionately affecting neighborhoods of color. Additionally, the arts district lacks connected walkability. How will you prioritize environmental initiatives, green spaces? And green spaces in our district. Yeah, I, I love this. I know you're getting a park. I think we should have more parks uh, uh, in this district, but I think that is the start, right? But not the end. Um, downtown people, okay, correct me if I'm wrong, but people move here because of the walkability of the neighborhoods and the amenities that you have. Like it's supposed to be, I think for New Yorkers, they're very insulted when I compare it to New York, but like a cosmopolitan metropolitan space where you can walk around, right? But the problem with that in a summer 24 seven city like Los Angeles where it's mostly concrete is that it's not always sustainable to do so. And so I think downtown for it to be the center of our city where it's supposed to be a model of public, I think it's the best place where we can attempt to do the best multi-modalities, right, of transit in the city, right? As the mayor thinks about a no-car Olympics, I'm thinking like this is the place all the way to the arts district and making sure that's part of the calculus of where we can finally connect all our bike lanes, make sure that we have the walkability uh, and the safety that is included, make sure that our dash goes east and west so that people can move around downtown properly, right? But in doing that, you know, we will need more bus shelters or tree canopies, right? Um, and I think to your point about the trees and getting, you know, for me, that is a, that's a huge issue that we're running into all over the district, but especially downtown where we're supposed to be making it a walkable space, we should be prioritizing that in development and making that an environmental, I mean, being part of the priority. And the last thing I want is for us to fight for that investment and actually have it done, and then for some reason then getting I think, I think Laura, you had told me about them getting ripped out or cut down. And it just was like so In the middle of the night. It was so wasteful to me. It just like even the Sixth Street Bridge, it was like, what, $500 million? And we can't even take care of it because the lights aren't even on? This to me is like, our, we're wasting our investments. We're wasting our assets. We're spinning our wheels. And so wanting to make sure that we do that. I mean, the other priorities for this district for parks is um, I think the Broadway Park, and there's been a draft of the Pershing Square, I don't know if you saw it, where it was supposed to be lush and all green and not just this concrete jungle in, in front of um, the hotel. But I think that's one of the other things I wanna prioritize as well. So I will add that the cost of putting in a park that's not concrete is a tenth of what it costs to put in a park now. Right, so that mm -hmm. park that we're getting put in is 32 acres. Amazing. And what did we, it was from like $30 million for that, or 40? I can't remember. Which one? For ours, the six Street Park. 12 acres and 68 million. Sorry, I was thinking LA State Historic, right. 12 acres, so smaller even scaled yeah. and full of concrete, right? So yeah. at the end of the day, you know, it's cheaper to plant trees always, yeah. so having that in the back of your head, I, I think I speak for everyone when we say we could, you know, the walkability issue for us is that it's not connected. Mm -hmm. So there's areas of the arts district that's very walkable, and then and then it's not. And then it's, it's scary, and it's not safe mm -hmm. for women. Like, my 
dream and my goal is always to have women be able to walk by themselves in the arts district and, yeah. and I, I, I don't think we're still there yet. Mm -hmm. So those kinds of, of things I think could go a long way. Um, thank you for that question. That's obviously my question. <laughs> <laughs> and city services. We're right. just underfunding them also. Um, okay, so so let's parlay to the, an even more difficult question, which is, Great. what is your comprehensive plan to tackle the homelessness <laughs> crisis in CD14, considering both short-term relief and long-term solutions? And you don't have to solve the crisis today, but just ideas of what we can, what will make sense to sort of move things in the right direction. Yeah, I mean, immediately, right? Building more interim housing sites in CD14. That's one, and having a safe park site for RVs. In CD14, I think there's only been three interim housing sites which are uh, that have been put in by the council member, whereas in CD13, in the same time period, there's been eight, right? Um, why is that? Especially when we have a model like Supervisor Solis' Care Village. So the six months, if we can, what is that? In four years, every six months, that's a lot especially as we are still not producing housing, affordable housing and transitional housing at a rate that meets, matches up with our unhoused residents, right? The sec and safe park site is a place for the RVs to park. We don't have any in the district. We just don't. And so when people complain about RVs parked on the street, they literally have nowhere else to go. And I think I may be preaching to the choir here that most of the people that are considered homeless or unhoused are the hidden working poor that are working really hard for you not to know that they're unhoused, right? That are living in their cars, that are taking showers at the gym, that are going to school for food, right? And those are the people that we need to be building for, for the in-between. Um, the second thing that I would say about, it's like the short-term, long-term, uh, comprehensive, I mean, for that one, I'm like, the homelessness crisis, even like the immediate approaches, I have, I'm like scanning my brain. <laughs> so if I'm closing my eyes, it's like a pianist playing, uh, you know, a symphony. That's what I'm doing right now. <laughs> but I'm thinking about the homelessness crisis and there's so many different buckets and approaches, right? There is a part where there is criminal elements that are a part of it, right? That we really want to get fixed and we want the police with their limited, with the budget that we have in the city to focus on that crime. Now with the unhoused community, there's another issue which is like a public health problem, right? Um, which is a county's responsibility. And so working with a county supervisor to really uh, try to work through a comprehensive approach to our public health crisis, which is in addition to our homelessness crisis and matching that kind of support. I think in relation to Arts District, uh, when it comes to Skid Row, there is a lot of organizations down there. Like I think it's over 150 that are down there in that small radius. And yet they're uncoordinated. And so wanting to create a task force with the county supervisor and really kind of marshal and lead all of these groups to work on this homelessness issue in that neighborhood, at least, because right now, I'm gonna go back to my football metaphor, because it's, it's all I got right now, I'm working on other ones, but the football metaphor is that there's just like eight quarterbacks down there, and like, no running backs. You maybe have a kicker, but who's gonna pass it to the, the finish line, right? or the touchdown? We're working on it, we're gonna get there. So, the end zone, the end zone, okay. I, I can't, my daughter had a soccer game today. It's still not a finish line of that game either. Um, but thinking about that coordinated approach. And the long term is always gonna be about building housing, streamlining uh, the approaches, but it comes with a cost of this buy right issue, right? And so how do we navigate that? How do we make sure that workers are represented in that process? And that's a tough question that I'll grapple with even further when I'm in office. And the last one is, out of my hands in that the, for homelessness to really end, our economy really has to change, right? Um, it's become a rat race, uh, especially when it comes with how much people are making, how much uh, housing continues to go up, 
And so I think there's a more global response. Oh, the last one. <laughs> The la real last one that is still in my purview would be tenant protections and making sure that people can stay in the housing that they have to prevent them from becoming homeless in the first place. And the highest, the, the group that's growing the most are seniors. And I have one story of, from my job as an eviction defense attorney, which is really awful. Um, it was a husband and wife. They got married a long time ago. His wife had a, a rent control unit and they never added him to the lease. And she died of COVID and he got evicted because he wasn't on the lease, despite having been there. And so living in an RSO unit, living on social security and survivors now uh, social security, where was he gonna go that was comparable that he could afford after having 40 years of a rent control unit, right? And so stopping the eviction to homelessness pipeline yeah, I couldn't find a shelter for him at the time, so he's like, I guess I'm just gonna live in my car. And he had no more support network because he was an aging and keeps an aged Angelino. And so those are, stopping that pipeline is super important. So just to follow up on, on this topic, uh, you are in support of repealing Municipal Code 4118. Um, this is the ordinance that does not allow encampments in the public right of way. Um, this, in this ordinance over the last few years has placed only two unhoused individuals into permanent housing at a cost of $3 million, um, with many of uh, these people returning to their original encampments. Um, what will you implement in its place if this uh, repeal is successful? Yeah, thank you for that question. I mean, I think part of one of the phrases we say on the campaign when we think about policy is like, um, you can't keep doing the same thing and expect different results. And if we, we are bold enough to try new things, I think we can also accept when they fail. And with approach to homelessness, I mean, I understand the purpose of 4118, right? But it's not achieving its goal, right? I don't, like as a mom, I do worry about my daughter, like, you know, walking down the street. Right? Um, I don't condone folks masturbating in front of schools or the drug use that is happening or all the crime that, like those are already criminal, right? And the police should totally be focusing on that. But when it comes to our homelessness problem, we really need to actually uh, provide them with the outreach to get them into transitional housing. We have to make more that exists to actually put them there and make it accessible, right? Part of why folks don't wanna come off the street and go into some of the transitional housing we have available right now, it requires them to give up a lion share of their things, right? If you have been unhoused for seven years and now you're given like what? Three days to get rid of most of your things and that is your whole life? That can be really debilitating, especially when if you've been unhoused for seven years, you've lost even three days of being unhoused, you lose your dignity because imagine how many times people choose to not look at you and ignore your humanity every single day. Now multiply that by seven years, right? And then your stuff, which has become your kin almost, you have to dispose of that. It's a traumatic experience. The other thing is they have to get rid of maybe sometimes their pets, right? Like going to a shelter, you can't go in if you're not clean, you can't bring your puppy, you can't bring your stuff, so you have to leave it on the street, which you know will a thousand percent get stolen, and your precious things like your medical, your medicine, or your ID uh, can push you further into homelessness and put you at risk if you even had a Section 8 voucher that was going to you, and so why would you go inside? Right? So making transitional housing services, uh, shelters work with services and making sure that they have a place for their storage. Because if it's raining outside and the shelter's only there open overnight and you're gonna risk losing all your stuff and your pet, then you're not gonna go inside, right? You'll take the tarp, right? And so making sure that that works. The other thing is for the folks that are outside, that's what's most visible for our homelessness problem, right? But those folks are dealing with mental illness, and that's a public health crisis. 
that is happening that definitely needs to be dealt with appropriately. They may be refusing services, but that's partially because they may not even know they're outside. And so working with the county supervisor, Hilda Solis, to make sure that we have a comprehensive response. The city creating another department, which it's gonna probably underfund for mental health, is not gonna work. So maybe we should just combine forces to work together to figure out these solutions and for me in Skid Row, leverage the community that already exists that are providing services or find out where the holes are so we can figure out who can, so we can resolve some of those services I think is important. The third thing that I think with 4118 is, has to do with the cleanliness of our streets, right? And so even in advance of, um, that's, that's going on right now through the care cleanups that the city does where sanitation workers are going to the streets and hosing them down. That's important. We, I'm, no, I'm not against that at all, I'm for that. We need to continue to do that so we don't have feces or other things on the street that could make us sick, right? But I think there are so many different, you know, the, what 4118 is trying to solve are so many other issues that I think we have to technically address in, in different ways. Um, that's just the way that I'm, you know, I've talked to advocates on the ground on how we should be approaching it better. And, you know, also y'all can hold me accountable when you're saying that doesn't work. Um, but really uh, thinking about those ways to address it, right? We have all those people who can do that for you. Oh, I trust. No problem. Yeah, yep. they're in the audience right now, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you. Yeah, I can um, yeah. So I think I want to ask. Let me, let me do this. It's my 100 days question, I think. Okay, since we're coming into a presidential campaign, um, I always like to think about the first 100 days. So, if you were elected, what would you what would you do to sort of address the long-standing neglect in our community in your first 100 days? I mean, the first thing I would do is, um, you know, schedule a town hall like this. I think. Going on the campaign trail, I feel like is necessary for every elected official because it forces you to go to, into communities and talk to people instead of talk at them. And so I definitely want to come back and listen to all of you more and then also assess and then have a new found, like as I'm learning, like what are the tools that are available? What are the limits of those tools? What are the limits of my ideologies, right? And come to you open with that as well. Because that's also something that, like, I'll be frank, is I'm learning as I'm going, right? And you are the experts, and I'm not someone who's shy of saying, I don't know enough, I need to learn, or I'm figuring out and I'm gonna change my position on something. So definitely would love to have another town hall to meet with this community. The second thing is, I think it's maybe not arts district specific, but um, convening, this is gonna be a lot of work in the 100 days, but convening all of the organizations in Skid Row, right? That's one of them as well. The other thing that I'm really excited about would be our Light Up CD14. Um, and so make sure that we can transition our street lights uh, into solar. And so right now the city budget only allocates less than 1% to street lighting and almost 50% of them are in CD14. And so whenever we vote for a city budget that doesn't put more money to street lighting, it's actually keeping CD14 in the dark. And so for me, it's like, how can we put more money into that so we can make sure the lights are on? Because that impacts the safety um, in the community for all people, house and unhoused, um, and also, you know, getting more trash cans. <laughs> that's, that is a, I mean, that's not part of Light Up CD14, but like the city services aspect of it is trying to pick up where the city has not. Yeah, I think we have the trash cans. I think the picking up part is somewhat <laughs> elusive yeah. in the neighborhood. It, it, yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I think we have one more question. Javier, you want to take that up? Yes. Okay. Um, so, as you can tell, maybe I'm, I like to be in the weeds of things. Um, so, I'll, I'll, you know, another, another topic that's been, uh, you know, we've been discussing tenants and landlords here a little bit, but separately. Um, one thing that community leaders here in the Arts District have been trying to do for a while is connect both the tenants and the mom and pop landlords together. 
um, to negotiate fair rental agreements. Uh, it, these efforts, though, have been blocked by various realtor associations, um, oftentimes. So how would you collaborate with city officials and the community groups to overcome, the, overcome these obstacles and bring both parties to the table? Oh, yeah. It's, it's tough work. <laughs> I mean, even during the pandemic. So during the pandemic, small businesses, even if you didn't make a lot of money, um, you were not able to get an eviction defense attorney. Um, that just was not available um, for, for our, from a nonprofit, right? And so getting a landlord to come to the table for a small business that's been a long-term tenant, tenant was so difficult. They would just send the notices, they don't want to negotiate, they just want to go to the, they just want to go to eviction court and they would end it. And so a lot of my job during that time was actually trying to negotiate a bunch of settlements for small business tenants and their landlords. It was really tough. Um, the county has a mediation program, which is voluntary. Um, so the landlord is not required to go. <laughs> and so this is important to me in trying to get the parties together, right? I think evictions are harmful for the small mom and pop landlord as much as they are for a tenant because it's expensive for everybody involved, it's emotional, and so for me, being the, the, the attorney that I am, I think trying to leverage my relationships with the local nonprofits to have these, uh, facilitate these negotiations. I think I have that's, some ideas for this. I love ideas. <laughs> I have to find money for a lot of them, but I love ideas. Just talking. Oh yeah, we're just talking, we're just talking. Um, but the other thing is also thinking about, um, you know, my opponent, is like backed by these realtor associations. He's taking big corporate development money that goes at odds with some of these interests and willing to sell out the community. So even though he says, you know, he's for renters' rights, you know, he's having uh, these big developers, these Blackstone funded folks, um, bankrolling his campaign. I think almost, I forget the number, almost half of his donations are from out of state, big corp, multinational corporate, or something like that. But they're out of state, they're not invested in our communities, and I think making sure that these small you know, businesses and these uh, landlords can find an agreement is a benefit of the local community, right? Not just some absent, uh, absentee, multinational, faceless corporation that's just trying to, you know, local. yeah, make profit, and frankly, when you're that big multinational, you would probably take the loss. Whereas if you're a small mom and pop landlord, you probably can't. And so community is very difficult, <laughs> I will admit, and not everyone's always gonna be happy, but trying to work together to make sure that there is a negotiation process that actually has teeth. I mean, and working even with state legislators to find ways in which we can and put some protections for small businesses in commercial leases because right now there's just no protections at all, right? Um, and the only one that I know that's helpful in these scenarios is that the county has a grant for rent relief for small business, uh, small mom and pop landlords and for small businesses, but the city doesn't have that, right? And so wanting to figure out how can we complement that program to make sure legacy businesses can have that kind of money in order to be able to, you know, can come to the table to negotiate. And one more thing. Um, can I follow up on this first? Is that, no. No. Are you, <laughs> are you willing to bring things to the floor of city council and know they're not, they're going to get voted down? Um, I'm sure that will happen. <laughs> Because I'm kind of so for them. but I don't know. But, but I don't know what that would be, right? Um, I think there's a lot to be said about a symbolic vote, but there's a lot. I mean, I'm a pragmatist at heart, right? There are a lot of things that I care about, and when I look at our city budget, I don't think it's working. And for me, that's not a symbolic vote. To vote no on a budget that just keeps giving money to the police when our lights are out in most of my district, that's a disservice to my, like, you know, as a lawyer client, that's a disservice to my client. So to me, that's not symbolic. That's my leverage in order to reopen this conversation with the rest of my colleagues to fight for something better for not just my district, but it would be for other Angelinos as well, right? 
but and uh, you know in recognition that they're you know so that's one thing the other thing about you know symbolic boat i don't know what it would be for <laughs> i don't know it's too ambiguous for me to think about that so so let's say you're bringing an idea to change something You've got four votes, and the rest of the city council you know is voting against you. Are you willing to bring, still bring it to the floor? I don't know. I have to think about it. I mean, I want to say yes, but I don't know. So I'm going to encourage you to say yes. <laughs> and I say that because too many times we keep getting told by elected officials, oh, we just don't have the votes. Mm. There was, um, Tom LeBonge was one of the few people that would bring that would bring stuff to the floor without having the votes. Mm -hmm. And it meant everything to his district. Yeah. And what that did was it inspired community members to get behind him to push a vote through the next time they brought it to mm -hmm. the floor. Mm -hmm. So I would highly encourage you to think that through and mm -hmm. think about what the ramifications can be. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing you're going to have anywhere from three to four votes on the floor. Yeah. And when we're talking about things like environmental issues, yeah. tree planting, um, having um, trees attached to affordable housing and not mm -hmm. having it pulled out by planning so it can be cheaper to build. Yeah. All of those things are things that you can have, even if it's just um, a symbolic vote, it means something to community. So I'm putting that out there. Okay, now it's not just like, uh, I thought it was just like me by myself and the martyrdom situation, but then to the point, to your point, one of my inspirations, which is one of my favorite people in life, Unisys Hernandez, was like even to have the conversation about the robot dog, right? She brought that in and like how much we were spending on this police robot dog, which is, I forget how much it was, but a previous city council would have voted that in no problem. Right? She didn't have the votes in order to prevent the purchase of this robot dog, but it provoked the conversation and opened it up. And so to, now when you flesh it out a little bit more, I was like, okay. Um, for me, it's like, that's the point of representation of this healthy dialogue that we have a diversity of opinions on council right now. I'm tired, the part of the reason why I was inspired by these other people that ran and why I wanted to run is, Gone was the day that city council that didn't have open discussion for the ordinances that they were passing because they were always unanimous. And for me, if there's no public discussion, all of that's happening in private. So where is the community input? Where is the transparency? And what we've seen through the tapes is, well, those closed doors discussions really lead to nefarious things that um, really uh, benefit themselves and not the rest of us in the district and in our city. And so wanting to have those conversations in public and have people that support maybe the things that I don't, that are not going to support my motion, explain why they want it. One minute is very difficult to get that point across. <laughs> I'm just going to go on record and say, Javier, I'm so sorry. Do you want to finish up your <laughs> I love it. This was way more okay. interesting. Um, I, you know, I think I would just maybe <laughs> want to ask one final question. Um, I think this race itself has been very interesting. Uh, you know, you definitely um, came in as the underdog mm -hmm. and beat everybody in the primary. So I'm curious, mm -hmm. um, you know, where are you at with, with your campaign? and where it's heading um, and you know what this next 40 some days look like for you. Yeah, 45. 45. Um, nobody's counting. Mm -hmm. uh, at this stage, we I have said this before to my team, um, we were building the plane as we were flying it. Now our plane is flying, which is fabulous because 40 days out we should be flying. So it's really great. I think from the primary to the general, it's like night and day. We were the underdog, now people are telling me I'm the top dog. I do feel like we are the top dog. Things have been very going very well since the primary. We've got a slew of endorsements. We built a big coalition, especially of people and organizations that we are determined to work with um, to make sure that we can work hard for this district, right? And our strategy has not changed. So in the primary, and I'm not sure if you all know this, we are invested in our field. We've knocked on 85,000 doors. And even though we were outspent, sometimes four to one, we were not outworked, right? Um, 
And so my team is continuing to do that work. We started early, <laughs> we started in June. We've been out there seven days a week. We have postcarding. We, we, we didn't even send a single postcard in the, I mean, we didn't send a glossy mailer in the primary because we couldn't afford it, but we sent 3,000 handwritten postcards. So we are upping the ante. We're doing 10,000 this time around, um, and we're doing it weekly, but we're doing what we do best, which is voter contact in forums like these, uh, making sure we meet folks, but we feel fairly confident. As long as we don't fuck anything up, as it were, um, I think we will finish what we started. And one thing that maybe you didn't know about me, but maybe you'll know about me now, is when I take a shot, I make sure I don't miss. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I mean, I was like talking to someone about Kamala Harris and compa the comparison came up about the presidential to, to the local, right? First woman, you know, Asian woman, attorney, and I just said, well, you know, the difference between me and the vice president is that I passed the bar the first time. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm smarter or anything like that. I did it with an eight-year-old too, um, but there's just some, there's something different about me. Um, but I'll definitely work hard and, you know, we're shooting our shot and my team is here. I want to give a shout out to, you know, our fabulous campaign team, our downtown organizer, Lavender. Put your hands up. <laughs> yeah, put your hands up. This is the first, so we've committed on our campaign, an organizer focused on downtown. Lavender has been onboarded in the last month, but definitely it should be your point of contact for any feedback or follow-up after this. Great. Um, so that concludes our questions. I would like to open it up to the audience if anybody has one or two questions uh, before we, we close this down. Um, with a little bit of experience, I had... What's your um, name? I'm Michael Hope. I'm vice president of La Raba, actually. Um, Thanks, Michael. Uh, local businessman. I've been in the arts district for about 10 plus years now. Um, a lot of focus I did over the last years down here was on homeless housing and veterans housing. Um, an experience I had was that we were going to house 85 people in uh, modified. Can you speak up a little bit? <coughs> in, mod in modified shipping style containers. Mm -hmm. um, we made arrangements with one city council member, mm -hmm. Herb Wesson, mm -hmm. and. That project was to, to build out with city workers mm -hmm. that definitely know how to hook up plumbing and definitely know how to hook up electrical. Yeah. And it was a scheduled out at about one point eight million dollars. Okay, give me one second. Michael's talking about a previous, you know, with his wealth of experience, a project where they, they were gonna work to house eighty five veterans and it was gonna be built by city workers and it was gonna cost one point eight million dollars. And within the next with council member Herb Wesson. Yeah. Right. And within 30 days, that turned into a 100-point RFP on a $4 million buy-in from the developer with a buyback, with a repayment system from LA. Mm -hmm. It used to be a pilot program on the park near, on the tennis courts in one Dickey Bay. Mm -hmm. And talking about Hot Wet Hot Air, talking about yeah. using city properties and using these places that, that he used. He used his office, he wanted to put one on his office property. Right? Yeah. And, but it took it away from the price values, right? And it was a locked bid. If you weren't, couldn't get in, the developers had to have previous, you know, and it was just this whole thing. And mm -hmm. they did it. And For it, one thing. It, it, so yeah. Michael's pointing out that the process, because it was on city-owned land, it ended up being a locked bid. Okay, keep yeah. going. And so after that, whoever could bid on these projects is already locked in. Like you had to hit a certain point and then you could start building on more. That was the, well, the way it was ended up set up. To the percentage of yeah. the land? Yeah. Okay. No, to the percentage of like, like um, let me just skip yeah, to this. Okay, so, sorry. Okay. so the project was sent to him to look at, we were, were gonna do this pilot program and it was sent, unfortunately, by my team, or the people that I was consulting with, without an NDA. Okay. And I was told that that process was being shopped around the city, and you know, that's how it sort of started. I mean, that's that's the level that it, it left our hands from, right? Uh -huh. And it did get built, and I've spoken to the man afterwards, and I, you know, just discussed it with him. <laughs> and uh, but what I'm asking is, is these alternative building projects 
can be done at a cost level that is amazingly low. Mm -hmm. And there is an immense amount of city property that, like Javier has mentioned, mm -hmm. that these projects can be done. Yeah. And also using these projects to build medical facilities and site facilities that, how, you know, that people can be treated and be welcomed in. Whether they go or not, they should be told that they have that service. Right. There should be billboards, there should be signs, mm -hmm. this address, this, how do you get there? You know, there's a lot of work that can be done mm -hmm. with these alternatives, especially putting the medical and mental out there as well. Mm -hmm. And are you someone that it could help us fight to put this alternative housing type of models into the city? Okay. So oh, what, can you be more? I so what I'm asking is, is can you help be a conduit to not being delved into these, you know, where it could be $1.8 million, but then falls into these processes of development that create this housing mm -hmm. at $4 million. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and yeah, there's yeah. a lot of reasons there, and I think you know, there's unions, there's this, there's yeah. that, there's all these other reasons. But when you look at the city dollars, you're spending your silly dollars. There's mm -hmm. plenty of money out there that's been given from taxpayers to, yeah. to do this. And there so, lies the bureaucracy. There is the bureaucracy. That's the question, right? Is there a way here to help expedite the process when there are things that are desperately needed in the yeah. city? And but right, the the you know the yeah, we're not getting box and seeing thing. people seeing this mm -hmm. profitability. I mean, with the profitability is there. It's just longer profitability. You yeah. know, you got to get people willing to wait for their money rather than get. Yeah, so starting to tell tell clients that they can take losses by investing in affordable housing. I mean, I was just talking to someone who's a builder like the other day who was saying that like they had pitched an idea, one with union labor, one without union labor, and it was the city would pay after it was built and how the city just ended up not doing anything, exactly. right? And I think, you know, the answer is so complicated to that, right? In part because like even when I toured the downtown women's center, you know, they're redeveloping the parking lot because the city attorney because the city attorney didn't review a document in time, the project languished into the new fiscal year, so they had to do another, um, what is it? Um, they had to do another assessment of the value of the property, which only hiked it up even more. And so the time lost at the city results in, you know, the unit going from 400,000 to 700,000. And for me, I mean, that is the unsexy part, but the part that's not in my platform is like, how do we make this all work, right? I mean, we have it's, these policies. It's the, biz, it's the business of it that makes sense. You know, we're building yeah. this beautiful type one construction mm -hmm. uh, housing project, yeah. right? Now, to me, oh, uh, Mike, is there is, another question? Yeah, yeah, what I, what I wanna do is, is, is the city planning on doing that more? Because that is a very good idea. If, to me, the idea is that homelessness is temporary. Mm -hmm. We're going to fix this somehow. Mm -hmm. And those that housing then can become affordable housing for family mm -hmm. and this because those buildings stay. That's what we fought for. Hey, you're on the committee. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, it's so uh, it's we, we need to start thinking how the city could build uh -huh. and then use these structures that you're building for different purposes right. as we fix it along the way. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, even though when I think about the commercial foreclosure closure crisis in downtown with those office buildings with law firms, law, I'm talking too fast for my brain, um, or I'm talking too slow for my brain, but with the law firms reducing like their footprint, right? I'm thinking like, what can we use that for? And one of the questions I had in my head is like, university, attracting universities, that's what certain constituents have recommended, but even changing that to like medical facilities, um, because it's still an office space. In addition to like, you know, of course, I mean, other ideas that a union has come up with is turning it into hotels, right? Um, in order and making that safe spacer, like safer for the Olympics. Like if we were to be able to speed up, like trying to think about different uses, right? And making it faster. But it is a very complicated process with so many different individuals involved. But for me, when I think about like being a small business attorney and thinking about contracts and like all of this stuff, for me, it always baffles me. You know, when corporations take things in house, it's supposed to streamline the process. But when the city takes it in house, it makes it even kills longer. It. it kills it. And so for me, it's like, how, as a city councilor, can I improve the bureaucracy? It's just the layers of ordinances that are supposed to all be good, sometimes really redundant. How can we fix it so that it's more streamlined so we can achieve these things at a faster rate? 
that is the unsexy thing that I want to do while I'm there, and, um, and hire more the, people. I think that goes to Laura's question as to, like, are you willing to go speak and hear no sometimes, you know, and, and oh, get yeah. that message out there regardless. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one more question. One more. Please raise your hand. Linda. Um, I'm Linda Tucker. I'm the Secretary of Barava. Um, kind of going along with Michael's question in the sense of, is there relationships you have from that year you work with the city at LADOT? Because mm -hmm. a lot of our roads are built like freeways. And so they're built for people to get through the neighborhood, not live in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And not only, and I know Laura is big on canopy cover as I am. And yeah. when you go to every other big city in other countries, they have canopy cover in the middle of the road right. in right. urban areas. And so like the street my office is on, you could probably fit six cars mm -hmm. and God knows there's probably 200 cars that use it a day. Yeah. Like it, there's just like, you could easily put a forest practically on our street mm -hmm. and the people that need to use it would get by and we wouldn't be a truck turnaround the street, which would be nice too. Yeah. Um, so just like, do you have relationships at LADOT? Is that important to you? Because also it'd be nice to have bike lanes. We've had, we passed two ordinances now to put more bike lanes in the city, but it seems like LADOT does a block at a time so that they don't have to put in bike lanes. Well, that's partially the problem of our capital improvements program, which is ad hoc and this happens every single year, whereas every other metropolitan city in America has a long range plan for how they actually fix the sidewalks, not based on which is the most, which one is the worst this year, right? <laughs> and it's like part of the problem of our budgeting and the lack of money and the lack of priority. And so I actually became interested in transportation because at the time Arizona started Great Streets. And because we had the Department of Transportation, a lot of the alumni from that program do move to DOT. They're in the commercial, I mean, they're in the, I think it's the climate, he does sustainability. There's another one on community engagement. And then my former colleague was, you know, in standing, she didn't get picked to be um, the general manager, but Connie Yano was, was one of my, you know, peers, maybe I would call her mentor. I don't know if she accepts that. I think she does. Whether you liked her or not, I still knew her. <laughs> and I still know her. But I mean, those are some folks that I have been leaning on for our transportation policies. But even, you know, the thinking about the capital improvements program and just like our yearly budgeting and how <laughs> we're just so bad at it. Um, so, so what I think CD14 has parlayed on is a lot of the projects that Metro is doing to solve some of these lighting problems and street mm -hmm, problems. Mm -hmm. The delivery time, it just goes on and on and on. So yeah. that's another thing. I, I think I shared that it took me five years to get the dash line actually moving through the arts yeah. district when it's based here. Right. They park their buses here. <laughs> For 15 years we were talking about yeah. it. They're, they're energy efficient. They don't use gasoline. We This should be the model in right. my view, right? Mm -hmm. and, and figuring out a way to get Dash be the transportation system for downtown in general, right. like as a whole. Um, yeah, housing and homelessness, always my first love, but one of my second, I mean, you know, one of the goals is like to be appointed to the Metro. Right, because I think public transportation, public transit, it meets our climate goals. It also affects the most working class communities. Um, no gondolas. <laughs> I've gotten in a lot of trouble from the position on that, but I am public about it. I ain't afraid to be told no to, to your point. Um, if I was afraid of that, then I would have not run because they tried to scare me out of it and told me I was a loser. But. I'm a winner, and we're gonna win again. So I don't know how we are. So we gotta do it as well. Okay, <laughs> we have we have five minutes. So one last question. Go ahead. First off, my name is Peter. Thank you for being here. We all appreciate it. What are your thoughts on changing the, the Weezar and Planning Commission's regime of disrespect and abject neglect of the artists? people who are the backbone of this neighborhood. Oh, can you say more about, I feel like you're talking personally, or like you have a specific. Of course, it's a personal question. The artists in this neighborhood have not been well served uh, by Jose Lizar's decisions to ignore them. And that continues through the planning commission. Many of us have been to those meetings mm -hmm. and found that when we ask for um, quality of life issues, 
we are completely ignored. That goes to noise, that goes to the issues that you've discussed today, such as trash and trees and making a decent neighborhood. Yeah. We were told, quote, and we've all heard this, you move here, that's your problem. Yeah. We have bars now that are not helpful. We never wanted them. We were told we wanted them. We don't want them. We got people throwing up in front of our building among other unnice things. And so we've been ignored by city, the city planning commission, not a little, completely, and that's my question. Yeah, I appreciate your question. Um, you know, artists that I work with, part of what we were trying to do, even at the firm, but even before then, was deal with their, their quality of life issues, which have to do with evictions, right? Even thinking about artists that maybe live in the arts district may not have enough um, may not be able to stay here in some of the studios here. But I don't think that's what you're talking about. You're talking about meaningful engagement with artists in the discussions about what happens in their neighborhood. And so, I mean, I'm here because I wanna hear from you, right? Um, I know what it's like to be dismissed and othered and be told that I don't matter all of my life. And that was a foundational point of why what this campaign is about, and that's why I'm so committed to governing with co-governance and having these community meetings, even if it means having difficult conversations or being in conflict. I'm okay with that. In fact, sometimes I need it. Um, I need to be told, because I'm not living in the arts district. I don't know what's going on. So for me, I welcome that conversation to hear your feedback on what's happening in the community. I mean, that's really important for me when I think about development, having meaningful community input um, and communities or community support for projects that do happen uh, in, in these neighborhoods. I, I think some of what he's talking about is also a disconnect where the sort of businesses are given priorities over the nature of what's happening in the neighborhood. So they can't sleep. <laughs> the sound is so loud. A lot of the stuff that, that businesses are doing, they're doing to stay alive or they're predatory, whatever the case may be, uh -huh. but they're doing it illegally and we have nowhere to go to make it stop. We can oh. file complaints, but you know, again, you know, we talked before you got here about organizing it. I'm really glad to see people showing up because it makes me so happy. I can't tell you, I'm a community organizer for 60 years old, so 40 <laughs> years. Yeah. Um, so it, it means a lot and it's real. And I think yeah. what they're saying and what, what I'm starting to hear in, in doing the land use stuff is, you know, too much noise, too much barfing and alcoholism yeah. in the streets, too much, too much, too much. I mean, we jumped the shark on uh, the limit of liquor license in the neighborhood 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. They just, we, we, had, we just, had no control over it because every restaurant, in order to survive, mm -hmm. needed to have alcohol on their menu because that's how they're paying the rent of the, the crazy commercial leases that mm -hmm. these folks are in. So it's just this compounding problem, yeah. but at the end of the day, they're sitting mm -hmm. in the same place that they've been. These are OGs that you're, there's a lot of OGs in the room tonight. Yeah. So um, we've got OGs from uh, Skid Row, we've got Arts District, I think we've got some folks from Lincoln Heights. Awesome. Um, so, you know, I think everybody that's here and that will be watching, a lot of folks told me that they couldn't come tonight, but they wanted, they were really excited yeah. to see the video, so. Yeah, what was your name again? Thank you for that. Yes. Yeah. Well, my name is Peter, and that's an extremely accurate summary. Right? Thank you, I, I, I appreciate you saying that. Well, when I talk about revival, thank you for the question, thank you for the summary, or the, what is it? Clarification. Yeah, I'm like the spark notes on it. Um, I think when I think about revitalizing downtown, I don't wanna do it in a vacuum. I don't think you can leave in an island. And so when we're talking about attracting small businesses to neighborhoods where there's businesses that are vacant, then I wanna talk to the community members and ask like, what's missing in your experience here? Like, are, do you need, like, I mean, I've talked to a couple folks that are like, I don't know where the shoe repair is, the closest shoe repair. I walk in heels in concrete a lot more than I used to, and man, I see the cobbler a lot these days. 
But like things like small business amenities like that. I know other folks are like, we wish we had a school. You know, whether it's for young age children or older or even high school, I mean, that may not appeal to you, but I wanna have those conversations to see what are the alternative businesses that serve for your livelihood and purpose? Is it a cheaper grocery store? I get a lot about Trader Joe's. Yeah. Um, Trader Joe's parking lots are already bad, so maybe downtown is the best place. <laughs> you don't have to drive they, there. They, or park. Did, they, didn't wanna, <laughs> they didn't wanna come to the Arts District. I don't know if it was the cost of the rent, not sure, but we did, we did look at that a while back, and that, I think that would be the only chain that everyone would be getting. <laughs> we would but, probably welcome a Trader Joe's. <laughs> but just to think about what are the other options, so it's not just 25 bars, in one area. I mean, in Highland Park, we're, we're having that fight now because it's also a fight for parking. It's a fight for a new, it's a nuisance issue. It's like all of those things. for our families yeah. and all the other things it attracts. And, you know, I think these are the conversations we want to be able to continue to be having with whoever our council member is. Mm -hmm. um, with that, I want to thank you all for being here today, sharing your Saturday evening. Um, thank you, Isabel, for coming in. Um, and uh, sharing your plans for Council District 13. Um, your engagement and openness is very much appreciated. Um, we also want to thank everybody who shared their questions online. All the questions we, we gave her were based off of those, um, all of you who shared some of your questions in the RSVP. Um, and thank you to our boards, La Raba and ADCCLA, who put this uh, event together. Um, also, uh, a special thanks uh, to our chair, the space that we're in here. Um, your support really has been instrumental in bringing us all together. Um, all right, so as we wrap up here, please take a moment to introduce yourself to Isabel Cuidado. Um, we have about 30 more minutes here, so please take advantage of that if you haven't already. Um, say hi, and uh, let's keep the conversation going. Um, and don't forget to register to vote. Uh, Cast your ballot in November, on November 5th. Um, and thank you again for your participation and enthusiasm. Boom, be the people, guys.